I do have a couple things to say about Rich, Dr. Cohen. Um, so, Rich was, he was a number fifth ranked high school player in the United States. Um, he was pretty much ranked number one in every age group from 12s to the 50s and 60s over his career. He played for UPenn, he was 42 and 3. He tried a couple years, it wasn't the pro circuit then, but it was the circuit. And he did that for two years and then he figured he better go to med school. Right, Rich? Uh, um, his strengths were mental toughness, speed, and consistency, which I can attest to as consistency, and I know Dan, everyone this is Dan Sears, he'll be helping, another legend in the area. Um, Rich is, it's not uncommon to go out and hit with Rich and use one ball for an hour, and not miss, okay? He coached LaSalle College for seven years, but the important stat is 60% of the players went on to medical school, all right? And, they all had high GPAs. As a senior player, Rich has been ranked number one in middle states, in all the divisions, age group, and he's won 17 national championships. to get a gold ball. His daughter, Julia, and son, Josh, are two of the best players ever to come out of the area. Josh was ranked number one nationally in every age group from 12s, 14s, 16s, and 18s. He competed in all four Grand Slams and he ranked as high as number 19 in the world as a junior. And Josh also, if you ever go to the, went to the Philadelphia Freedoms a few years back, he was the coach for the Philadelphia Freedoms. Julia Cohen competed as a professional in all four Grand Slams. At age six, she was ranked number one in the 18 under doubles for middle states. Think about that for a second, age six. At age 15, she was number six in the world as a junior. She played college tennis at U of Florida, uh, transferred to Miami where she was number five in the country, NCAA Division I. Seven months, this is recent history, Rich had a heart attack. Seven months after his heart attack, Julie and Rich won the father-daughter national championships. Seven months. And finally, as a psychiatrist, Dr. Cohen has been in private practice for 40 years. He has done re research with doc Dr. Joseph Walpi, who is the second most famous psychiatrist in Detroit. He has worked uh, with many athletes, tennis players, including some of the members of the Philadelphia Eagles football team. He's published in, this will help all of our ladies for Daltra, he has published in Panic Disorders uh, and Agoraphobia. So, without further ado, Dr. Cohen. I'm really humbled by that introduction, but truly, I'm only really the third or fourth best tennis player in my family. <laughs> my kids are a lot better than me. My, my wife, Nancy, has even won a gold ball, a national championship. So, uh, I'm probably, I don't rank that high in my family. But, but anyway, I'm going to talk to you about mental toughness techniques in tennis. Now, mental toughness techniques are really important. What percentage of the game do studies have been shown to, to find out, to show us how important mental toughness techniques of tennis, what percentage of tennis do you think involves mental toughness, everyone? Does anybody have any ideas? 90%. Actually, that's really good. I'm impressed because I've, I've given talks like this all around the country at Macy's Tennis Academy and John Newcomb's Academy, and uh, people don't really get this right. Your exact people have said 80 or 90 are exactly right. It's been shown to be 85%. So it's so important. And I'm going to try to give everybody some weapons. Just like you have weapons that Doug teaches you on stroke production, I'm going to give you weapons to use for mental toughness today. Now the first weapon we're going to talk about is visualization techniques. Has anybody ever used visualization to get better at things? You could use it in various areas of your life to overcome fears, to decrease anxiety, but in tennis they're also used. Tell me about, has anybody used visualization for tennis? Can you tell me about that? 
Well, just a little. Um, I find when I serve best is when I, before I even serve, I visualize where it's going to go. This serve is going to go there. And when I do that, it really does help. Before, that's great. Just, you know, this is where it's going to go, and that's it. That's very good. Excellent. I'm glad you're... Uh, well, visualization really should be used for two things. Number one, it's to use to decrease anxiety before you play matches. And the way to do this is, it's important to watch your opponent the night before a match, or the before a match if you can, to see their strengths and weaknesses. And one of the things you want to look at are a number of things. You want to look at how many adjustment steps they take before they hit the ball. The more adjustment steps you take before you hit the ball, the better a player is going to be. Like if, for example, Nadal takes 20 adjustment steps, Federer takes 19, a good senior player takes maybe eight. So, because the reason for that is because they're going to get the right point of contact before they hit the ball if they take more adjustment steps. And you want to look at how long the ball stays on the racket head of your, the person you're going to play the next day. The longer it stays on the racket head, the cleaner they're going to be able to hit the ball. Therefore, the more consistent they're going to be and the better they can control their depth and their consistency. You're going to also look at what side is weaker, their forehand or backhand. So, you're going to visualize the night before, let's say they chip their backhand and it's not as strong or steady. You're going to visualize the night before putting yourself in a nice relaxed state, breathing in for four seconds, out for six seconds, thinking of a nice beach scene, the sun is at your back, the wind is at your face, feeling all your emotions, you, you smell the salt air, you're in a very relaxed state, you can feel the nice sand touching you and you're very relaxed and you're feeling yourself getting wide to their forehand and then getting into their backhand after that. You're going to feel yourself taking a lot of steps forward because they're probably going to hit the ball short in the court and you're going to get aggressive with your next shot, split stepping and coming into net and you're visualizing yourself punching away a volley. So that's an example and you're going to be calmer the next day when you play the match. And so therefore, when you play a big point the next day, you're going to be not as nervous and you're going to be able to play big points better. It's important to have, of all of us, to have a little bit of anxiety. But if we have overwhelming anxiety, we're not going to be performed as well. We're going to be able to, performance curves have shown that people have had to have some anxiety in situations, you perform better. And then when it's overwhelming anxiety, the bell-shaped curve goes down and you don't perform as well. So you want to have some anxiety and this will stop overwhelming anxiety, being able to visualize how to play somebody before the match. And it's been shown that you're not that nervous the next day when you're playing the match if you visualize and rehearse the match it's called guided imagery the night before. So you want to do this. Now, second, we also want to use visualization as a weapon to make our stroke production better. We all want to, have, there's, we all want to like use, after every practice session, I want everybody to visualize the one thing mechanically you didn't feel you did well and you, I want you to do two things. I want you to shadow it. It's going to take you about 20 seconds after every practice session to shadow the one thing you didn't do mechanically well. And then not that night, I want you to put yourself in a relaxed state and picture in your mind's eye, putting yourself in a relaxed state, breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth. Long, six seconds, you're going to be in this relaxed state and picture in your mind's eye hitting the stroke correctly. You'll notice when you go on the court the next day, that stroke is going to be a little better. So you're going to use visualization to control your mechanics. And there's about 20 things on every stroke that you're going to think about and you're going to pick one 
that doesn't feel right. I'm gonna go through each of these 20 things with you and you're gonna go through a mindset. Danny, this is Dan Sears, he's a, he's a great player, hits the ball very clean and his, his mechanics are very good. So we're gonna go through first, let's go through forehands first. Everybody I want when they go on the court, I want you to go short court to just really get the feel of the court and feel depth and consistency. And you're gonna start out with Eastern forehands all the time. So you'll be able to hit semi-westerns. And on each, on, on an Eastern forehand, watch Dan, uh, he's go, he takes the racket head back after the ball bounces to get good timing. Where do you want me to take, hit that, that hit way? The, go towards the net. He's going to take the racket head back with an Eastern forehand. The ball bounces. He takes the racket head back a little bit more. He reads with his palm and he goes, comes up with the ball and comes up with his body. Up, 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 perfect. And gets really good timing. And if that goes off, this may be one of the things you want to visualize. Notice he comes up on that forehand in contrast with which we go through backhands. You got to stay down the whole time. And he'll visualize that in just a second. Now you're going to go from that to semi-western forehands in the in the court, short court. And what you're going to do is you're going to do the same thing. The racket head's going to hit the ball exactly like the eastern forehand, two inches from in front of your body. But you're going to lead with the bevel, get underneath the ball, watch him lead with the bevel in the direction he wants to hit, and. He's going to get under the ball, come out and over the ball, having a, a windshield wiper approach just like that. Excellent, Danny. Good. And he comes up as he hits, unlike the backhand. Come up when you hit. Perfect. And watch his bevel go in the direction he wants to hit. So if he wants to go, in, he's going to practice inside short court. He's going to practice inside out. Go inside out over there. Watch how the bevel goes into the area he wants to hit. Good, and come up. Perfect, and now inside in, the bevel's gonna go in the direction he wants to hit. But watch the follow through. The follow through comes across his body, unlike anything else where it goes out like that, where he goes inside in. Excellent, Danny, good, perfect. Now, those, so those are about four of the things on forehands. Now, backhands, to get good, this is really important to get good timing. And a driving backhand, the ball, take the racket head back a little bit, and then he, the ball's bouncing, and he takes it back a little bit more for good timing. Stay low, it's very important. Watch his front foot as he plants it into the court. Everybody's gonna plant their foot really hard, and feeling the court with your foot, that's a universal thing you wanna visualize. And then he's gonna come up and out just like this. Excellent, Danny. Now, I want you to, if you want to hit a crisp course backhand, the same motion, but I want you to use more wrist and get on the outside of the ball. Watch. Excellent. And he, watch, he's staying down on these shots, unlike, unlike the forehand. Now, he's going to do, the only, he's going to practice and visualize his chip on the backhand. And what you do, the same thing, take, the ball's going to bounce, you take the racket head back just a little bit more, watch him, and then he's going to karaoke, smile as the follow through, watch his racket, smile as he karaoke. Excellent. Smile with the racket head. The racket head's going to go this and he smiles. Perfect. That's excellent, Dan. Now I want him to volley. The, the point of contact on the backhand, by the way, is six inches always in front of your body. So you're going to visualize that. Here's the universal things on volleys. He's going to put all his weight on the forehand volley, on his right foot. The racket head is going to be an inch in back of his body. And then he's going to carry the ball out like this with a big step. Take that big step. Good. Carry the ball. Excellent, Danny. And then the backhand the same way, but instead of leading with the palm, you're going to lead with the bevel, just like that, and carry the ball out like that. Good. Okay, that's perfect. Hey, Dan, do that again. <laughs> uh, excellent. Do, do it again, Danny. Carry the ball. Out. Good. Beautiful. Now the universal things on overheads, you really need to move your feet a lot. You're going to move your feet a lot, and you're going to get underneath the ball. 
keeping your head up the whole time and get under the ball and then just use your wrist to go over it. But you need to keep your head up the whole time. Excellent. And now, first serves don't matter. I never, that's a crapshoot. I don't want anybody to visualize that. It's second serves matter because you're not going to be able to hit your first serve unless you can hit second serves. And the technique I want him to do on this, and this second serve everybody should aspire to get is a little bit of a top spin kick serve. You want to get to the backhand side visualizing, tossing it above your ear to the forehand court, toss it above your left eye if you're right-handed. You want to get and you want to do these things. You got to really start out with a good turn of your left shoulder, separate the arms, getting into a back scratch position, get under the ball, have the point of contact at seven o'clock, go towards the ceiling, go out towards that fence, the right fence, and then keeping your head up and going over like this and everything comes down together. Thinking you're going towards the ceiling, up from seven o'clock to one o'clock out towards that fence, keeping your racket in depth and over the ball. And excellent, Danny. Keeping your head up, good. Beautiful. So don't drop your head, keep it up the whole time. Yes, now go down. Excellent, good. And then split step. Those are the 20 universal things and you're gonna pick one out after every practice session to visualize in vivo, that means on the court, and in vitro, that means at home at night, and each of these things are gonna get better. And as you're doing this, don't think about what anybody else is doing. Compare yourself to yourself, and don't compare yourself to anybody else, because there's always gonna be better, and always gonna be wor worse, and you're gonna just see yourself improve. And that's gonna be the fun of things, seeing yourself get a little bit better, and because you're not gonna achieve, and having, we'll talk about goal setting in a little while, but you're not gonna, things are, that are important in life are to have goals to know where we're gonna be and where, and where we're trying to get to. And when we have these goals, it's gonna be really fun to try to achieve them. And because, and you're not gonna achieve them just by luck. They're gonna happen by, by, by working at them. It's gonna feel good to work about them and get better at our own pace. And in doing this, you're gonna have a good realistic sense of who you are as a player. So therefore, if we're grandiose, we're not gonna get better because we're not gonna be able to set realistic goals. And or if we're self-defeating, and self-effacing, we're not gonna get better because we don't have a realistic sense of who we are. So it's always good to have that. So right now, we talked about already the two ways as a weapon of visualization. Now we're gonna talk about the second uh, goal weapon is gonna be concentration. This is very important. And I'm gonna teach you some techniques in concentration. And these techniques I'm teaching you in tennis can be transferred to relationships, to work, to, for kids who are edging their education. And they're gonna, so therefore, all these techniques are gonna be good life lessons. And as you get these life lessons in tennis, it's gonna make your work, relationships, and a school a lot easier. So, concentration is really important. And the way to develop laser focus and concentration and to be a horse with blinders while we're playing tennis is to stay in the here and the now. Staying in the here means that we're going to stay focused on in time on the point we're playing and don't think about two points before and uh, what happened when you missed an overhead pass two points before. <laughs> And don't think about uh, uh, the future. Stay in the in the here, right in uh, in the now, and right where we are while we're playing this match. So we're staying in the same time in the now that we're at. 
I had, I've helped a lot of juniors with mental toughness, and they tell me how during the matches, they're writing speeches and staying in the present, and they're, they're writing speeches about what they're gonna say to their parents or coach about why they lost the match. <laughs> and instead of really staying focused on the match, and they already have it all figured out, uh, about how the excuses they're gonna make. And you can always win a tennis match no matter what the point of score is, but if you, you, you don't stay focused on uh, the, the time you're on and the point you're playing, you're going to lose focus and you're not gonna do as well. And this, this is also important to, for, I've had players that are up 6-2, 5-2, all of a sudden they're writing they're already thinking about how they're going to celebrate after the match is over. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden, it's, it becomes 5-4, a tiebreaker, they lost the second set, and they're in the third, feeling really frustrated, getting very angry, not being able to control your aggressions. And we're going to talk about this in a little while. Tennis is a game of controlled aggressions. You've got to be able to control your emotions, your aggressions. It's not like you're running a 100-yard dash and you have to be very aggressive. In tennis, you've got to be able to control your aggressions and therefore, people can have low frustration tolerance if they're already celebrating why they've won a match. And they're not really thinking about uh, about staying in the now, staying in the time they're at, and all of a sudden, the match gets away from them. So we talked about staying in the now. Now let's talk about staying in the here. What that means is stay in the place you're at. I had players that are like, instead of staying on the court you're at on, watching your opponent, watching your strings, thinking about your mechanics, they're looking two courts down about what their friend is doing. And they're looking, they're thinking about what's going on a couple of points down, or they're focusing on the crowd and what people are saying about them, and people not clapping for them at the right times. And they're worried about all these extraneous things in staying on the, in, in, in the place they're at, and, 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 and really focusing on the place they're at. So, you need to develop laser focus staying on the court you're on and no other place. And the more you do this, staying in the here and now, you're developing muscles of concentration and the better it's gonna get. And you do this in practice and then you're gonna be able to do this in lower level matches and then bigger matches and then national tournaments. And it's gonna go in stages just like stroke production. When you, when you think about your strokes, you, when you're refining them and developing all these techniques for your stroke production, you're going to do practice them in practice. Then they're going to get better in practice, then lower level tournaments, and then higher level tournaments, and then big points in big tiebreakers. And you're only going to be able to develop, this is a, you're going to be developed in stages. So you're staying in the here and the now. Does anybody have any problems staying in the here and now? And tell me about it. Okay, tell me about it. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yes. <laughs> that's a, that's an interesting point. She's making a lot of interesting points here, uh, which is which is she's making a lot of. Uh, let me let them move these chairs and I want to you comment have upon them. Okay, oh sure. Let me let them move the chairs just a second so we get this all together. <coughs> you, you, know, you know, you're making a lot of uh, You're making, what's your first name? <laughs> Jen is making a lot of interesting points. What she's talked about is that she's, she, she doesn't stay in on the, court, on the court she's on. She's thinking about what her friends or interesting points are going down the court next to her, and she's not staying focused. And then she's also 
talking about a very interesting thing that's a very common thing for players players that are playing like interclub matches. She's worried about, she's having a lot of anxiety that her opponent is, her partner is going to get upset with her. That's going to, it's very important to have communication with your partner so you're accepting of yourself and others and non-judgmental. Healthy personalities are accepting of themselves, they're non-judgmental, they, and they, they, you have to have good communication with your partner because it's going to cause overwhelming anxiety to be not only fighting the battle you're playing on the court to try to win together, but also being an army on two fronts and fighting the battle of the unrealistic world, the unrealistic world and fighting, uh-oh, my, my partner's going to judge me and be angry at me, and therefore, having all this anxiety, you're going to be an army on two fronts and you're not going to be able to perform optimally and be a well-oiled machine as a team functioning together. And so therefore, it's very important for doubles partners to have good communication, to work on before the match, acceptance of themselves and others, not feel like they're being judged, because when you feel you're being judged, you're going to have overwhelming anxiety. And therefore, in any relationship, you want to really be able to work on trust, communication, and the ability to compromise differences. And if you, these seem like easy things, but if you work on it in partners, in tennis, it's going to help you in your relationships with your significant others, with work relationships. So you want to really be work on trust, communication. You're not always going to think alike, and you're not going to always have but the ability to compromise your differences and to accept yourself and other people. So, does that answer your question, Jenna? And kind of what? Okay. Can anybody tell me some other things? So you're going to use this in doubles matches. Can anybody else have trouble staying in the here and the now? If I'm What's your first name? Susan. Hi, Susan. Hi. Hi. Go ahead. Um, I find that if we have a match that's moving slowly, I'll go over and I'll watch some match and say, ours doesn't look anything like that. Or, you know, why is it theirs is going so fast? And, and we have lulls and it's like that time that it's slower or loftier balls. And, okay. and what I want you to do is accept who you are as a person and a player. And, <laughs> and not like, don't just compare yourself to yourself and not to other people. Okay. Because it's going to be really hard. There's always going to be better and always going to be worse. You can't improve if you're thinking, boy, like I'm not as good as this person in this area. And there's that's going to happen in school with other people and in, in your jobs, comparing I'm not feeling as competent. And therefore, just compare yourself to yourself because it puts too much pressure on yourself to compare yourself with other people and you're going to feel stuck and not improve. So try to real be and accept yourself have acceptance of where you are at, at that stage. There's always going to be levels of tennis, and people don't understand this. Don't feel, and everybody's going to be at their level, and to have a realistic sense of the level you're at, to not belittle yourself and be self-effacing, and not to grandi over-grandize yourself, and feel you're at another level, and then you can improve. Don't compare yourself to others, and don't be so hard on yourself. So that's really important but you're not going to get ahead of yourself. You're not going to feel, I'm up 4-2, four, four, 40 love, I really have it 5-2. You're going to stay focused in the here, but you're going to, and not play a loose point, but play a smart point, and maybe serve and volley on that point. So you're not going to get ahead of yourself. Okay, so that's it. That's a very important thing. What happens there is he's getting ahead of himself and thinking, I've got this game won, and you don't want to get to that point. Okay. Anybody else have anything right now before we go on? One more. Um, how do you handle when you have that easy shot and just blow? Okay, that's a really important thing to say. <laughs> Not that it happens here, but I've heard it. Well, I, <laughs> I, I, I didn't think it happened here, but but anyway, what you want to say is you don't want to think about. First of all, you want to do rehearsal after you blow anything. It's not every workout counts. It's every shot gives you a chance to start a good habit or start a bad one.
So not every workout counts. It's every shot gives you a chance to start a good habit or reinforce a bad one. Let's say you just blew an overhead and you put your head down. You want to visualize in those 25 seconds, rehearse in your mind's eye or in vitro, keeping your head up on that overhead so you don't blow it the next time. You don't want to get a lot of negative emotions in your head and you want to use those 25 seconds in a positive, with a lot of positive energy. Breathing in through your nose for four seconds, out through your mouth for six seconds and utilize those 25 seconds and visualizing the stroke in the right way. Doug talked about blowing a forehand volley into the net. If you wanna really keep your racket head up, don't drop it, lead with the palm and carry the ball and visualizing that and don't let your racket head go down on that shot. And, you, and then what you have to do is you use forgetting that shot that you just missed. Don't, don't think about that shot. So what you do is you want to forget about that shot you don't miss and go on so you can focus hard, staying in the here and now on the next point. Does that make sense to you, Doug? Okay, so you want to use rehearsal and you want to use calming behavior modification, breathing techniques, and utilizing the 25 seconds in between those points, that point as a, as a weapon to get better. Uh, do people, does everybody understand that, what you're gonna do when you miss an easy ball during a match? Go ahead, Adam. Um, yeah, I played uh, college tennis for like four years and I've hundreds of matches in my life, and I think something that really helped me when I missed an easy shot or if I, you know, up 45, like I know that I gotta get this point. So I'm trying to focus on another aspect of my game that I'm trying to work at. Like for example, I'm, I try to challenge myself to like, all right, at this point I'm gonna play with a lot of spin and stuff, because that kind of gets my mind off that I have to win the point and instead focus on the, like some, some part of the game and stuff. Very good, excellent. Yeah, I just wanted to add that. Can okay. people relate to what Adam just said? I call it like a performance goal instead of an outcome goal. Yeah, exactly. And I'm going to talk that you're leading us into the next topic of goal setting. And that's excellent. Doug just brought up something really excellent. Very, very good, Doug. Uh, what we, we, we have to remember, we're in tennis and in life, we, we have to know where we're at and we're going to have to know where we're going. And if we don't have that, life that won't make any sense. We want to get goal setting. And goal setting is going to be divided into two areas. Performance goals and mechanical goals. And they should be short term and long term. Uh, short term uh, performance goals may be I want to be able to, uh, to win a match in a sanctioned tournament in the next three to six months. In the next one to two years, I want to get a high sexual ranking and go on and being able to play a national tournament. Or maybe even win a gold ball someday. So they could be long-term goals. And it's good to have these goals to know where we're going and, 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 and it makes life fun to really kind of have goals and know where we're going. Uh, so you're going to set these performance goals and then you're also going to set technical mechanical goals. Uh, one thing, one goal may be in, uh, in the short term, uh, I'm going to have a reliable second serve. How do we do this goal? Well, one thing that you want to tell players to do is before you leave the court, you're going to be able to hit five second serves into the forehand side without missing five serves in a row. And then you don't get to leave the court. If you miss the fourth one, you've got to start again and go to the first serve and get five in a row. And you want to keep on thinking as you're doing it of everything you want to do, as Dan demonstrated before, separating the arms, 
turning your shoulder, dropping the racket head, going up towards the, the ceiling, keeping your head up, go to that fence, let your racket head drop with your head. And you're gonna be doing, the whole time, you're going to, as you're hitting the ball, the, the wrist is gonna to be towards the ceiling. So you're gonna be thinking about your technique the whole time, and you're gonna go through five things in your short-term goal Five balls to the forehand side. After you've achieved that, you can't leave the court. Five things to the backhand side. And you're going to develop this, and that's going to be your short-term goal, for example. Your long-term goal is maybe, I'm going to hit ground stroke so I can keep the ball in play for a half hour without missing, being able to feel rhythm, and being able to control my depth. Shorten the court you're going to start out with, and then go back and long into the court. Long into the court is being able to follow through out more. So therefore, and you're going to get a rhythm, and you're going to be able to, so that's a long-term goal, to be able to control your depth and keep the ball in play for a long period of time. Tennis is an anaerobic game, but then you're going to be able to use tennis to increase aerobic skills if you have more skill and you can keep the ball in play and never miss. So that's maybe a long-term goal. So you're going to set short-term goals and long-term goals. And these goals should be specific. You, you can't just say, I'm going to get faster. You're going to say, I'm going to really be able to run in the base, from one baseline to the other side of the baseline in two seconds. So they got to be specific. They got to be smart. You got to really be able to make them realistic. You're going to say, you can't say, that uh, these, uh, if you're a club player, that I'm going to be, be ranked high in the ITF. Because you want to have a realistic sense of who you are as a player. They got to be also uh, reasonable. If you're a, going, a high school player, you don't want to say, I'm going to practice seven hours a day because you got to go to school. And so you want to really make them, and they got to be timely. There's got to be there, there's levels that you want to get to, and so you want to think of your time-wise, these goals are going to be timely, in a timely manner, so you want to go from what you want to do in the next couple months, and what you want to do in four months, instead of expecting to jump from a, a low level to a very high level all at once. You've got to take things in stages, and therefore, and that's why it's so important to know your level of play with your stroke production, in your, uh, uh, in, in, in how well you can compete, and you're going to improve all these things at your own level. And don't expect to jump from, you can't beat players 10 levels above you, but you can, if you have good mental techniques, beat somebody a couple levels above you. And you're going to be able to do this as you develop the mental weapons that I went over everybody with you today. And these mental weapons, don't expect to go on the court tomorrow and have them all, do them gradually. Now also, it's important to understand uh, that as we do all these things, you're going to, uh, to get an optimal level of play and being able to practice really hard, you've got to do some off-court training. You've got to have good nutrition. Borg, Bjorn Borg, who was number one in the world, won Wimbledon five times. In practice, he would run down every out ball. He would run everything down. He could do this and try 100% because aerobically, he was in great shape. He, has a, he had a resting heart rate of 39. Uh, his, he worked on core strength, so he could actually try really hard. You make your core stronger. The way you do that is build bridges, do pelvic tilts, try to do these every day, work with bands to make your shoulders more flexible so you can work really hard. So physically and aerobically, you're going to be strong enough so you can run down every ball. And you're going to feel gradual improvement every day. Uh, so those are very important things that, that you could work on. And it's really important to understand that as you do all these things, it's going to be fun. And you're going to feel yourself getting better. 
And that's going to be really, it's not going to happen by chance or luck that you're going to get better. And it's going to get better by hard work, but then it's going to feel good. And you're going to, it's going to even feel better. You're going to transfer this over to your education, uh, to your job, and your these mental and relationships, and in all areas of your life, all these things are going to improve. So those are important th things to think about. Uh, I went over a lot of things. You must have some more questions right now. Um, how often do you see like ice hockey? A team scores, the other team scores tennis or bell time matches. We win the first set 16. Next thing you know, we're down 0 4 in 20 minutes. How do you handle okay. that? What, does anybody know the most, in, that's a great point, Doug, and does anybody know the most important game of the a match? The last one. No, there's one game the last. that's been shown to be, research has shown there's one game of a match that's more important. I think a couple people know this. The first game the second set. You know it, exactly. I'm really proud of you. You know, that's, that's very impressive. And the reason why the first game of the second set is the most important game of the match. If you win the first set, and if you win that first game of the second set, you can start to steamroll the other person and get really bad. Also, because people tend to let down in the first game of the second set. And if you lose the first set, all of a sudden, if you really try hard, and you don't get down emotionally, winning the first game of the second set makes you give you. If you break the other guy's serve, that puts you right back in the match. And you're right there, you'll have positive energy, and you'll do really well. So that was, I'm very impressed you do that. I'll be worried tomorrow. I'll be worried for the first game. I don't care about what happens in the first set. The first game of the second set is the And try, try not, you talked about worrying and try not to, to be able to control anxiety as you're playing the match. Use breathing techniques to not get too nervous during matches so you won't be overwhelmed with anxiety. You wanna have just a little bit, but use breathing techniques. The 25 seconds in between games, uh, in between points, and the time you have in between games, you should be able to control your emotions, aggressions, and anxiety by using breathing techniques to be able to overcome that so you're going to be able to perform optimally. Now, you know, in itself, it's just a game, but it's fun. Why not try to do our best in, in this and to really be invested in doing our best, even though it's just a game, because you'll feel better about ourselves, and it, as we do our best, it will increase self-esteem. And so, and this self-esteem will actually be able to transfer to other areas of your life. Jim? So advice while you're waiting to be served, to like, while you're waiting to return a serve. I tend to go everywhere while waiting for a serve, okay. and then all of a sudden, I'm hitting it out. Right? Okay. As opposed to being in the point. Tennis, you have to go, tennis, the friends of tennis rules say, you have to go, and go with the speed of the server in playing points. As you're waiting to serve, it's very important to have happy feet. And what I mean to do, Danny, can you uh, demonstrate happy feet when you're returning serve? Thank you. Danny's gonna be returning serve right here, okay. and he's gonna show you, it's very good to have happy feet. And when you move, and then you're gonna do this for two reasons. I'm gonna explain that. You're returning serve, you have to go with the pace of your opponent. He's in time, he's moving his feet around, having a lot of adjustment steps, getting ready, and you're gonna use this, and you use this for two reasons. It gets you ready to actually be able to return serve, number one, and number two, you're not gonna be overwhelmed with anxiety because you can't do, your mind is not, the physiological parts of anxiety of rapid heartbeat, shortness of breath, the sympathetic mimetic nervous system is not going to be uh, utilized at that point in time because you can't do two things at once and you're going to be just concentrating on moving your feet. So you're going to have happy feet and moving at that period of time. Uh, 
Okay, any other questions with this? Okay, I think that um, is um, any uh, other points you want me to bring up, uh, talk about in the mental toughness of tennis today. You said tennis is a game of controlled aggression. Can you unpack that? Sure. When, when you run, let's say you're a track athlete and you're running a hundred yard dash, you need to be really, really aggressive in doing that. And you don't think about controlling aggression. But if you're overwhelmed with, with uh, everybody has that not so ni ni nice side of them called the subconscious, as Freud talks about, with a whole bunch of aggressive and libidinal drives. And to be able to go on in life, we have to accept them with equanimity and realize we have that not so, so nice side of ourselves called the subconscious. So we have all these and part in when we come out on the tennis courts, we could be feel really aggressive. If you can't control your aggression and feeling overwhelming rage and ang and uh, and uh, feel like throwing your racket and not being able to control this and screaming and yelling, it takes away from the focus of being able to play points. So I gave you techniques to use to overcome these aggressive feelings so you can control your aggression as you're playing tennis. You need to have a little bit of aggression as you're playing, but if you're overwhelmed with it, you're not gonna be able to perform optimally. Does, does that make sense to everybody? Okay. What about the opposite way? I always, See, the, the, I win, uh, I'll win the first set or I'll win the second set, and then after the match, they'll come up to me and say, you're too nice, that's why you lost. Okay, that's, it's important to be very nice to your opponent after the match is over. <laughs> While you're playing the match, to do your best, it's important to be able to focus on the match, not think about, I'm gonna be nice to your opponent. What you're gonna think about, I'm gonna be honest and fair with my opponent, and try, and part of being fair is doing your best. It's, it's a hostile gesture to play somebody and if your opponent is not trying really hard, it's condescending and it's not part of being the friend of the game. You need to always try your best to respect your opponent. I want people when they go on the court, I want you to respect everyone, but fear no one. That's the best attitude to have. Respect everyone, but fear no one. Does people understand that? I'll give you a scenario. Yes. It happened in my doubles match earlier today. We scored 30 all. Our opponent hits a volley. My partner calls it out. I trust it was called. My opponent served without calling out the score. We win the next point. We call for the cause. Okay, no, no. We won that. This huge argument ensued between my partner and his best friend about what happened on that point two points ago. So, how do you handle that? Well, Fred, first of all, it's important to understand to have to have integrity. What what you usually do at that point is what an umpire would do would be go back to the point, the friend of the court would say, go back to the point where everybody agrees with the score. And that would have been 30 all, and play it from there. Uh, it's very, and at that point in time, I would ask the, usually a referee of the tournament would tell people, call out the score, the server would have to call out the score before each point. Now, Danny would be an example of somebody who, like you, is too nice on the court. And it's important to have us, all of us narcissists have, have too much of a sense of entitlement. And so a narcissist, you won't tell them to err on the side of selfish because they're too selfish. But I have a lot of patients that don't have a very low sense of entitlement and I have them making decisions, erring on the side of selfish. And if I was telling Danny what to do or you what to do, 
I would tell you to make decisions going back to the center of things and erring on the side of selfish, which I would never tell a narcissist to do because they're doing too much of that. Narcissists are personality disorders. They, uh, they have a long-standing maladaptive way of dealing with the world where they, uh, where they don't suffer. They're egocentric to their problems. And you wanna, if you're trying to treat them, you wanna make them uncomfortable, ego dystonic to their problems. So that's very important to understand. Wait, so if you're playing a narcissist, you'll be extra nice? <laughs> uh, I would actually make decisions erring on the side of self. So that would be very important to do. Uh, well, I had a similar quote, I guess you were talking about it going back to the sport thing. Um, a similar thing the other day, except me and my partner thought the game was over and we won it. Like it came to the score thing. actually gave in to her apart to her opponents but knew it wasn't fair and then stewed with anger afterwards it's very important that you deal with these kind of situations in the here and the now when it's happening and not two games later when you're already stewing and because she was so angry and frustrated it caused her to lose future points so it's very important in each situation that occurs in a match to deal with it at that point in time. Now, basically what you're saying, make sure that if they don't call the score, say what's the score before they, before they serve. That's wonderful, yes, and deal with it. Yeah, and, you're, and you're, if you're gonna be so frustrated, you're gonna be overwhelmed with aggression, anger, and rage, and keeping it and maybe interjecting it, people can interject anger and turn it inward and get dysphoric, frustrated, and so but it dealing with it in the situation where it occurs. And that's why dealing with things in the here and now and might happen to some people and you don't deal with it in the point of time when it occurs and you stew about somebody taking advantage of you in a work environment and then it can affect you there and it can affect your performance and you might interject that anger and when you interject at that anger, you can come dysphoric, depressed, and frustrated, and disillusioned. So keep all that in mind. So dealing with that on the tennis court and in life can make a difference in your life. So, so this is an example of, we're gonna use these techniques. Like I, I taught my kids how to play tennis, and but the reason why I wanted them to have the, the, the lessons of tennis and was not to make them world-class players, which they did became, and they became a lot more than I ever thought they would be, and I'm really proud of them, but I knew the life lessons they get from, got from tennis, they could transfer to their life academically. Julia graduated college, although she was 97 in the world, uh, played all four Grand Slams, beat four top 10 players, beat Pliskova, uh, beat Wisniacki, beat Sloane Stevens, she graduated college in her master's program, summa cum laude, and she was able to transfer the skills she got from tennis to life. Josh, although he, he's a really super nice guy, he transferred the skills he got from tennis into how, in communication skills, how to work with people, and how to handle frustrations, and it served him well. And the life lessons that my kids got for tennis really was, I thought is not the achievements they made, but uh, the life lessons they got. And listen, somebody's most, my most important job was not being a psychiatrist. My most important job I always considered was being a parent.
parent because that was really the most, so that's really the most important job I had. I, but I really, I, I love tennis. I hit every day. I have the joy of hitting. I can't wait to after each workout to the next day I can get on the court and hit tennis balls again. I've been, I've been playing for many years and I love it. In fact, I like it so much I wrote a song about tennis, so I'll end things singing it for you. Okay? <laughs> if, if that's okay. But I have a bad voice. Tennis, making spirits sublime, a game for all seasons, a sport for a lifetime, hitting firmly, feeling in the zone, light on my feet, textbook strokes are shown, sliding on clay, rushing net on grass, jump, anticipate, hitting the crisp cross court pass, grueling workouts, chipping approach shots, the joy of hitting and loving it a lot, reading draw sheets, a good win's what I need, anticipating rankings, then beating the top seed. Tennis, making spirits sublime, a game for all seasons, a sport for a lifetime. Winning in the juniors, then pursuing professional goals. Looking forward to senior events is what the future holds. Playing the circuit, stories about the past, camaraderie with the players, friendships that always last. Raising two children, teaching them the game, having good sportsmanship is more important than all of their fame. Playing for Penn was the greatest thing for me. Reinventing the moon ball, then going 42 and three. In 1980 at Kinwood, Ken and Rich had aching joints, and after an hour and 29 minutes, the world's longest point. Against Harvard, he ran right through the gate, put a lob back into the court that sealed the Crimson's fate. What you taught me, I will never forget. Trying my best and being in best and being intense in all of life's test. Tennis, making spirits sublime, a game for all seasons, a sport for a lifetime. Tennis, 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 a sport for a lifetime.